first passage that we read in Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. And um, we're going to refer to the other passage as well. But our main, the main verses we're looking at today are 19 through to 21, which I'm just going to read just now. Remember, these are Jesus' words to us. Matthew 6, 19 to 21. Jesus says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. National newspaper recently reported the following. Pulling back the bed in her son's bedroom to search for a lost toy, Liz Turner was horrified by what she saw. The expensive pure wool carpet was in tatters. It got worse when she inspected the wardrobes. Two designer dresses were riddled with holes. Beside them were, as Liz describes, tiny wormy things wriggling around. These were larvae, evidence of a major moth infestation that over the next few months would cost her £5,000 and a great deal of frustration in a doomed bid to eradicate. And Jesus reminds us that all the physical things that we can obtain in life are at best temporary and are susceptible to all kinds of damage. He tells us that moth and rust destroy. The following account is of the Western Isles Council in 1991. It was Monday the 7th of July. The convener had made his way to the council offices where the director of finance was waiting for him in the corridor. Can I have a word? The finance director asked. The convener listened with horror. Over £24 million of the council's money had been lost in the closure of the BCCI bank two days previous. The council employed a third of the island's workforce and sustained countless further employment. And this disastrous time on the other side of the Minch is evidence that reminds us that treasures on earth can never be secure. That as Jesus says, thieves break in and steal. Now I'm sure we can all think of precious, precious things that we ourselves used to have. Maybe your first car, I wonder where it is just now. But for one reason or another, they were taken from us, damaged or rendered valueless. And that's the nature of all things that we can own in this life. Now that might sound very negative to start off with, but we're not going to be negative today. Because Jesus in this passage asks us to lift our eyes above and beyond the passing here and now to the eternal perspective and to learn two vital truths. The first one, there's treasures available that are infinitely more important and valuable than what we can gain in this life. And secondly, it's very important to know that treasures on earth and in heaven are mutually exclusive. We're either storing up one or the other. So four things I want to think about with you this morning. Uh, first of all, I want to think about what our earthly treasures might be. Secondly, what it means to have treasures in heaven. Thirdly, the motivation for storing up treasures in heaven rather than treasures on earth. And then to finish off with, we're going to look at two brief illustrations that Jesus used on other occasions to show the very different results that treasures on earth and treasures in heaven bring. So let's go back to those three verses in Matthew chapter 6. Let's read them again because they're so important for us. 
at verse 19. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now the key word in this passage is definitely treasures. What does Jesus mean when he talks about treasures on earth and treasures in heaven? Best way to answer that question is to look again at verse 21. Jesus says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So where is your heart? Where is my heart? In other words, what is at the forefront of our thinking and attention? What is of central importance? If we're to go back to this, what would you wish for? John Piper comments, when the heart is sent, it values it, it cherishes it, it treasures it. That is what worship means. So what do our hearts treasure today? What do our hearts worship? Now, perhaps it's easy for you to work out the answer to that question. Or perhaps it's something you need time to go home and reflect on. But Jesus is asking us in this passage to take stock of where we are at, of where our hearts are. Because where our hearts are has eternal consequences. Now, before we go any further, it is important to recognize that Jesus isn't saying that what we have, what we need or do in our lifetimes isn't important. Many things are necessary, legitimate, important, and are indeed blessings. Family is a wonderful gift from God. We are part of the rich fabric of the community that we belong to. Education, employment are important in finding fulfillment and in providing us with, the, with what we need. Money in the bank is necessary to pay the bills. A house is required for shelter, for warmth. We need a place to call home. Sport is not discouraged in Scripture. If you read Paul in the New Testament, he's often using sporting imagery to picture the Christian life. Music is a God-given gift to enjoy. Think of David the psalmist. He was also a skilled player of the harp. All of these things can be positive and healthy, but they can become earthly treasures if we place them at the very center of our affection and thoughts. One writer says, it's not that the good things on earth should be seen as bad. It's our view of them and the value we put on them that makes them our treasure or not. So I think it's important just to think through how good things in life could become treasures on earth. Let's go back to sport as an example. As I said before, I believe sport can be a great blessing in life as long as it doesn't occupy the center of our hearts and lives, as long as it is not what we worship. I'd like to illustrate, first of all, with a healthy example. You'll all have heard of Eric Liddell, I'm sure. Running was extremely important to him. He won an Olympic gold medal. You don't win an Olympic gold medal if the sport is not important to you. But it was only important to him as he submitted it to Christ. So when sport clashed with his faith at the Paris Olympics of 1924, his faith was proven to be his treasure. And when he knew the calling of God to be a missionary in China, he left the racetrack behind, even though he was still very early on in his career. He hadn't reached 
um, the peak of his running powers. Compare that to someone else um, who spoke in such a way that showed that football was everything to him. Now, I'm sure Bill Shankly, who's the a great manager of Liverpool Football Club, was somewhat tongue-in-cheek when he said the following, but it stands in complete contrast to Jesus' teaching. He said, Some believe football is a matter of life and death. I am very disappointed with that attitude. I can assure you it is much, much more important than that. And this statement sums up a lot of people's lives. Sport has become their treasure. So if you like sport, honor God in it, but don't let it make its home in the center of your heart. Let's think about wealth now. Wealth can be a gift from God also. Again, when it doesn't rule our hearts and lives, when it doesn't become our treasure. Again, to illustrate with a positive example, Abraham in the Old Testament, he was a rich man, but he rejected wealth when it would become a snare to his following of God. You remember having the opportunity to go to live in Sodom, where the grass was green, where he would become even richer. But at that point, he turned from Sodom because he knew that his faith and the faith of his family would be compromised there. But if wealth is our treasure, it becomes a snare that keeps us from following Jesus as our Lord and Savior. We read about the rich young ruler. He desired eternal life, but money was more important for him. Verse 24 of Matthew 6 tells us that no one can serve two masters. You cannot serve both God and money. The scripture tells us that Jesus loved the rich young man, but that money was this man's idol. And Jesus deeply longed for this man to follow him, but the man's idol was too big a barrier. And Jesus is warning us here that although we must come to Jesus as we are, we cannot come to him on our own terms. John Piper comments, the reason money is so crucial for Jesus is that across all cultures and all ages, it represents the alternative to God as the treasure of our hearts and therefore the object of our worship. It becomes the great threat to our obedience of the first and the last of the commandments. Our savings in the bank can become our treasure, the security in which we trust. Just one other example of um, how earthly treasures can get hold of us. I think in today's culture, the image can so easily become our treasure. I think we're encouraged and pressurized to project an image of our personality and appearance. And the image we project is so often very different from the reality of who we are. What other people think of us becomes what makes us important. Our image becomes our idol. And this stands in sharp contrast to the way that God sees us. And it's only how he perceives us that ultimately matters. Where is our real value? Is it not that we're created in God's image and that he loved us so much that he died to pay for our sin and bring us into relationship with him? God knows us and he wants us to come to him as we are, warts and all. And it becomes very difficult for us to come to God as we are if we at the same time are trying so hard to create a false image of who we are to others. At the end of the day, no earthly treasure, sport, wealth, image, or whatever, is going to fully satisfy. The rust and moth of our lives in this world will make sure of that. 
And worse still, Jesus is telling us that earthly treasure keeps us from Christ. And if you've never come to Christ before, it could be like the rich young man, that there is an earthly treasure in your life that is keeping you from him. And Jesus isn't just speaking to people who are yet to come to faith in Christ. He's speaking to Christians as well. Because believers can be snared by earthly treasures also. 1 Timothy 6, Paul writes to Timothy there and he warns about the dangers of loving wealth. He writes there, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. I've quoted from Solomon already today. And it's, it's devastating when you read about what happened to Solomon later on in his life. His treasure later on in his life became his lust for women. 1 Kings 11 reads, King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women. They were from nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them because they will surely turn your hearts after their gods. Nevertheless, Solomon held fast in love to them. As Solomon grew old, his wife turned his heart after other gods. His heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God. So Jesus is warning us here that believers can also compromise and damage their faith because they let earthly treasures take the place of their heavenly treasures. So, we're being asked here, what is our treasure? Where are, are our hearts? The final verse of Psalm 139 is a prayer that we would do well to pray in regard to this. David writes there, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Okay, we're glad to hear that's um, the big point out of the way. Um, we're on to um, our second point just now, what it means to have treasure in heaven. Okay, so what does Jesus mean when he says, store up for yourselves treasure in heaven? First of all, for the person who has not yet become a Christian, we do not get to heaven by trying to store up treasure in heaven. What we need is the greatest gift by far that you can receive. And that's the gift of eternal life. Only those who receive this free gift can have the treasure of heaven itself. Eternal life is a free gift. It's not worked for. But remember, it was won at the great, greatest of prices by Jesus himself, by his sacrificial death on the cross. And to receive eternal life, that gift, it's given through forgiveness, forgiveness of our sins. And we must seek this gift. It must be our overriding concern. That's why the rich young man left Jesus sad. He desired eternal life but his wealth was more important to him. So how do you come to the point when you receive this gift? Jeremiah tells us, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. What about the Christian? What does it mean for the Christian to store up treasures in heaven? How can we know that we are storing up treasures in heaven? in heaven? Is it simply a matter of our service for God? If you look back at Matthew 6 just now, the context is that we should examine our motivation for our service to God rather than the service itself. Look back at verse 1. Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. When you look at that verse there, um, you see that our service should be hidden where possible. It shouldn't be flouted. 
And if you follow through the rest of the chapter, you see that Jesus is constantly showing this point to us. He talks about there, about giving to the needy. He talks about prayer. And he talks about fasting. In each situation, he's telling us that when we engage in such activities, um, who are we doing it for? Are we doing it um, to look good in front of other people? Or are we doing it genuinely because we want to serve God out of love for him? If we are serving with the right motivation, that is an example of our heart being in the right place, of our treasure being in heaven. And it's a really important point. Remember Paul, what he writes in 1 Corinthians 13. He says, If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I have nothing. So what Jesus, what God is telling us here, um, is that as we serve him, we're doing it out of love for him, not so we can get respect of other people. Now, there's lots of other examples in Scripture of how the Christian life should be working for the kingdom of God. In this, we are storing up treasures in heaven. John chapter 13, Jesus, Son of God, he's setting a great example to us. He's washing his disciples' feet. And he says to his disciples, now that I, your Lord and your teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. And we need to work out in our culture what that means for us. It means serving each other. Matthew chapter 10, Jesus talks about our little acts of service that we perhaps don't think much of, but are of great value in his sight. He says there, and if anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones because he's my disciple, I tell you the truth, he will certainly not lose his reward. Suffering for Christ on this earth may be part of our treasure in heaven. Peter tells us in his first letter, if you suffer, suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. Another way we will gain treasure in heaven, although we're not serving for that purpose, is sacrificial giving. Think back to the poor widow in the temple who gave two small copper coins compared to the Pharisees who were putting in their bags of money. And Jesus saw the heart. He knew that she was giving out of her poverty. She was giving all that she had. So by living out the teaching of Scripture through the great motivations of love and thankfulness to God, by the power of God's Spirit, that's how we store up treasures on heaven rather than on earth. Ultimately, our treasure should be in heaven because our treasure is Christ. If we're trying to earn rewards, then our motivation is all wrong and no rewards will follow. But on the other hand, Scripture does imply in several passages that there will be a link between the level of true service and the glory experienced in heaven. Now, I don't want to go far down this route. It's a difficult area. But just to give you one text uh, in Daniel as he prophesied about the Messiah's second coming and judgment, Daniel writes, those who are wise will shine like the brightness of heaven and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. We're moving on now to our third point. So the motivation for storing up treasures in heaven rather than treasures on earth. So why does Jesus implore us to store up treasures in heaven rather than treasures on earth? What motivation are we given? He desired the best for the rich young man. He desires the best for us. Jesus wants us to understand that treasures in, her in heaven are infinitely more important than treasures on earth. Let's start with the negative side. Treasures on earth, and we've talked about this before already, they'll leave us 
disillusioned. The writer of Ecclesiastes, possibly Solomon, describes how he searched for meaning and riches. He writes, Whoever loves money never has money enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with his income. Treasure on earth can be destroyed or taken away from us, whether that be due to moths, rust, theft, or the collapse of banks. One thing is certain. They can never be taken beyond the grave. Job's famous words summarize this for us. Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall depart. And treasures on earth are almost certainly sinful. They tend to be about me, to be self-centered. And to God, anything that comes between us and him, anything that we worship other than him, is an idol. And like the rich young man, we'll leave both ourselves and Jesus sad. Now, on the positive side, treasures in heaven are secure. They're permanent. The hymn of John Newton says, when I've been there 10,000 years, bright, shining like the sun, I've no less days to sing God's praise than when I first began. There's no moss. There's no rust. There's no theft. There's nothing else that damages or destroys in heaven. 1 Peter 1 reminds us that God in his great mercy has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. And the following sum saying sums it up. Only one life which will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. So, is our view of our existence short term or eternal term? Are we in it only for the here and now, which will soon pass? Or are we, are we in it for the here, the now, and the ever? Think of Moses. Do you remember how he was brought up in the riches of Pharaoh's palace? He was there growing up as the son of Pharaoh's daughter with all the privileges that that brought. And as he grew up, he became aware of his own people and his God. And Hebrews tells us that Moses refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be ill-treated along with the people of God rather than enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. Can we relate to Moses or do we find ourselves siding with the rich young man for whom here and now was more important than the eternal? Now, it may be that we would like to aspire after Moses' example, but we find ourselves locked into the mindset and desires of the rich young man. And to be in such a situation is not to be without hope. The first thing the Lord has to change is our desire. Our desire to seek him as the ultimate treasure. What we need to do is ask him to begin a change in our hearts. And as Jesus says in chapter 7 of Matthew, we sang it earlier on, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened unto you. We're almost finished. Uh, I just want to conclude now by going back to the words of Jesus because he says it better than anyone. And um, I want to read two illustrations that Jesus used to highlight the ultimate eternal value of spiritual treasures as opposed to the temporal limited value of earthly treasures. Firstly, the words of Jesus um, as he tells us in Luke 16, about the rich man and Lazarus. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen, and he lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, 
covered with sores, longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In hell, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away, with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been set in place, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. And the second illustration that Jesus used um, is found in Luke chapter 12, and that is of the rich fool. Again, I'm quoting straight from Luke 12, the words of Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, Watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. Now these two wealthy men's problem was not that they were rich. We've already talked about Abraham, for example, who is a man of faith, who is also extremely rich. Their problem was that they were living life for the present and for themselves, with no reference to God and with no thought of eternity. Their treasures were being stored up on the earth. It's also important to realize that Lazarus was not accepted into heaven because of the dreadful poverty he'd experienced in his life, but because his treasure was in heaven. And both of these illustrations, they bring home to us really clearly, they emphasize the folly of living for the short term, which will inevitably end sooner rather than later, as opposed to living for eternity. Because at the end of our time on earth, when we face when we come face to face with God, the only thing that's going to count is our spiritual treasures and legacies. All else will be vanity, irrelevant, and forgotten. So Jesus has a really serious message for us today. And just to finish off with today, he says to us in Matthew chapter 16, what good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? And I hope that what Paul expresses in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 is true of us. He writes there, So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Because what is seen is temporary, but what is eternal, sorry, but what is unseen is eternal.